This is Kentucky Afield Radio. This is Ron Rohde, Kentucky Afield's first host back in 1953. Now, I'm proud to present Charlie Baglin. Kentucky, it's your state. And in its outdoors, you appreciate healthy animal populations, songbirds, deer, rabbits. On the weekends, you want safe and fun places to boat. At the creek, you expect fish to say hello by striking your bait. People who love the outdoors want a robust outdoors. That's the standard. We'll introduce you to someone who wants the same thing. The newly appointed commissioner of the Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife. Greg Johnson is next on Kentucky Afield Radio. I've never seen anything like this. I can't believe I waited so long. What will you say? My heart was pounding. This is Kentucky. It's deer season, and it's outstanding. 146 record book deer in the past three years. Modern gun season, November 8th through 23rd, with archery season open now. What do you say? Yeah. I can't believe I made the shot. Get your license and deer permit now, and take aim on the thrill at fw.ky.gov. You know our patch, but there are some things about the Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife you may have never dreamed. For a young mind, every day is an adventure. In schools and in summer camps, we reach 70,000 kids every year, keeping the world a hands-on, minds-on, feet-wet place where nature and knowledge can take root. Kentucky Fish and Wildlife, your partner in the great outdoors. And you thought we were just fishing and hunting. Hunt more at fw.ky.gov. This is Kentucky Field Radio. My name is Charlie Baglin. The Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife. It exists because people exist. Because wildlife, the birds, frogs, deer, matter to people. A government entity is in place to watch over, to manage, to study, to measure, research, police, teach about, showcase, and allow the wise use of these natural resources. Nature doesn't just take care of itself. In Kentucky, on its own, wildlife is not in balance. Alaska, maybe, and other vast wilderness areas where the predator-prey relationships still exist. But in Kentucky, with 4 million people or more, no wolves, no mountain lions, wildlife management has to step in. And the Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife has a new man in charge to lead that effort. And he is our guest this hour. A warm Kentucky Afield welcome for Commissioner Greg Johnson. Well, thank you very much, Charlie. Good to be here. Seventy-year history this Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife has had. You are its eighth commissioner. You and I met for the first time. You were having a meeting welcoming yourself to the department, and you wanted a sort of a meet and greet at the Salado Wildlife Center. This was in Frankfurt. <laughs> I said, I'm Charlie Baglin. I do the radio program. I'd love to have you as a guest. And you said, would love to do it, but you'll have to give me until fall. I've got a lot on my plate. Mm-hmm. So what have you been doing? Yeah, when, when we discussed, um, when you first met me and we talked about that, you know, there were a lot of things going on with the department. Uh, I came in at a time where we had had several audits completed on the department. The state office of inspector general had completed one. Um, there had been a financial audit completed. So we had action items. We had uh, recommendations. We had things that we had to deal with in those audits. The audits themselves, I didn't feel like they were a threat to me or the department. The key on audits is... If you feel they're accurate, then you need to embrace what's in those audits. You need to embrace the recommendations. You need to put an action plan together and move forward. So really what we want to do is make the department better based on the findings that were in the audits. And so we were able to do that. Fortunately, in my past career with the U.S. Department of Agriculture, about three years of that, I was an internal auditor. And actually, for the Natural Resources Conservation Service, the agency that I worked with, I kind of stood up their audit branch from scratch and wrote the policy. And so I'm familiar with audit procedures and kind of where you need to go with that. So what we wanted to do was just take something that people might have perceived as a negative and turn it into a positive and build on it. And that's what we did. And I think we've gotten past that. I've worked hard on the morale of the department. 
I think uh, we're in really good shape right now, about 17 or 18 weeks into my tenure. I had that down to bring up. I'm glad you've already brought it up when we've covered that. Yeah, and it's, you know, I think the public kind of knows it. It was in the newspapers and stuff, so we might as well, you know, we'll put it out there and let everybody know that I think we dealt with it in a very positive manner. I have worked with your Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife staff for 24, 25 years, and I have have the privilege of working with some really top quality people from the fisheries biologists, wildlife biologists, people who teach hunter education, your directors. I mean, you, you really have a top flight crew. I think you can be proud of them going forward. Oh, yeah, yeah. Top, top to bottom, there's no question about that. There's two things that have really impressed me about the the folks that worked for the department. One, it's their their professionalism. Everybody is very concerned about being professionals, about being on top of their profession, about being a good biologist or a good conservation officer or, or being the best they can be as a as a hunter education person. You know, we put about 5,000 kids a year through our camps and when they're busy in the summertime, those people are all just doing an outstanding job. The other thing that's really impressed me about the department is the passion that everybody has for the job that they do. I don't really think anybody in the department views what they do as as work. Um, I think they view it as just their life calling, and that's what they do. That's what they're all about. Our resources, our fish and wildlife resources, our outdoor activities, sustaining populations for future generations to hunt and fish, you know, top to bottom. It's just it's just amazing what the department gets done every day. Your grasp on this shows that you have been interested in fish and wildlife, hunting, fishing, conservation all of your life. This isn't something new for you. What kind of route did you take to get into conservation, which ultimately led you? to the Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife. I know you were born, what, northern Illinois? Yeah, yeah, I'm from uh, northern Illinois, a little community up there called uh, Wasco. If you go about 50 miles west of Chicago, and when I was growing up there, when you finally got to where it was wall-to-wall corn and soybeans, (laughs) um, you'd find a little speck on the map called Wasco, about 200 people, and probably 80% of them that lived there were related to me one way or another. The Legion Hall there was named after my uncle, you know, that type of environment. I grew up farming in that community. We had feeder cattle. We grew corn, soybeans, um, hay, wheat, and it was about a five, six hundred acre operation. I got interested in, in just the land and land ethic at an early age and then probably started hunting when I was about 10, 11, 12 years old. Of course, fishing just in the creeks around there from the time that I could walk and carry a fishing pole. Made a lot of trips to Wisconsin. You know, you're just a stone throw away from sure. Wisconsin that far north. Really a lot of good opportunities for hunting and fishing in that state. And um, I'd ice fish at Lake Mendota and Madison, fish for walleye in the Mississippi River up around Alma, Wisconsin, and uh, did a lot of fishing up around uh, northern Wisconsin. You were a fishing guide for a while, weren't you? Yeah, that's um, once I got out of high school, like a lot of kids, uh, when you get out of high school, sometimes you don't have the financial resources to, to go to college immediately. Uh, I knew I wanted to do that. I knew I wanted to major in, in wildlife or fisheries. And I'd been looking at several schools, but, you know, I needed to, to work a little bit first and save up some money. So that's where I ended up, up around the Hayward Spooner uh, area there in northern Wisconsin. Uh, guided fishermen on the uh, Namakagan River up there and some of the big lakes, mostly for uh, smallmouth and, and walleye and northern pike. That's some good eating fish. Mm-hmm. Yeah, sure it is. is. Yeah. Now, I read, and I got this out of a press release that I read about you, that one of your clients that you were guiding was, what, from Richmond or from the Eastern Kentucky University staff? And uh, how'd that story go? Well, it was interesting. They came up, and what they wanted to fish for was was bass, which, you know, everybody in in Kentucky likes to fish for bass. Uh, A lot of the lakes up there didn't have a lot of bass in them or or nice, you know, good-sized bass. So I I talked them into fishing for northern pike, and their eyes kind of widened up when I tied a steel leader onto their line, (laughs) put a silver spoon on there and a chunk of pork rind, and they had a lure about eight inches long. So they were uh, pretty receptive when we brought the first one in, though, and it was a nice size northern, and 
a pretty good set of teeth, you know, that kind of stuff. But they, they said, why don't you come on down to Eastern Kentucky University and visit the school? And I hadn't been down there yet. I'd visited Wisconsin at Stevens Point, Southern Illinois University and some places. And so I uh, I got on a bus in, in Spooner, Wisconsin, and rode it, Greyhound bus, and rode it all the way down to Richmond, Kentucky, and visited with the wildlife uh, professors down there at EKU. That was yeah. a long ride. Yeah, it was. Um, um, it was a long ride back, too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when we come back, we'll talk about this new Fish and Wildlife Commissioner and how he has been an influence in Kentucky wildlife conservation for decades. And what new record have we just set? We'll find out. We're talking to the new Fish and Wildlife Commissioner, Greg Johnson. I'm Charlie Baglin. You're listening to Kentucky Afield Radio. You're listening to Kentucky Afield Radio. My name is Charlie Baglin, and we are continuing our conversation with Commissioner Greg Johnson. He became head of Kentucky Fish and Wildlife in May, and he's no stranger to Kentucky. His college career was spent being an EKU colonel. Every college kid needs little income, and this is where your conservation career in Kentucky actually got its start when you were at Eastern. They talked to me about maybe getting a part-time job with uh, maybe the Forest Service, you know, that kind of thing, which that did materialize. So when I went, when I ended up at EKU, I also worked as a co-op student for the U.S. Forest Service in Berea there at the um, research station. And we did research on reclaiming strip mines, not only just in eastern Kentucky, but all throughout Appalachia. So this was in the middle 70s. Um, yeah, this was um, around 75, 76, right in there, yeah. You were in Kentucky, and you were becoming very familiar with our hills and streams and oh, rivers yeah. and the lifestyle and the mindset of the sportsmen and women of the state. Yeah, I think um, once I started college at Eastern, uh, there was probably a 23-year stretch there where... I lived in Kentucky. I started out with the Forest Service, and after three three years with them, I moved over to what was called the Soil Conservation Service. Now it's called the Natural Resource Conservation Service. NRCS. Yeah. A lot of people know about those. NRCS. And um, I worked in Adair County, Russell County, uh, Wayne County, Clinton County, That's Casey God's County. Country. Yeah, McCreary County. Yes. About 1988, I became the state biologist for NRCS. Of course, I was working out of Lexington at the time. Um, after a couple years, uh, I moved out as an assistant uh, state conservationist, and uh, I was headquartered in Cynthia. I had a 28-county uh, region when I was headquartered there, about 54 employees. A lot of people that used to hunt with me during that time period said that there wasn't wasn't a road that I'd never been on in the state, east to west. <laughs> um, I'm not sure that was the truth, but, but I knew the state pretty intimately from, from all those years. By then, you know, we considered Kentucky home. Uh, my daughter was born in Somerset. My son was born in Richmond. My wife's from Burnside. So we always knew that Kentucky would be the place that we would call home. Somewhere in there, the uh, Natural Resource Conservation Service decided to open up five regional offices across the nation. Uh, one of those was in Madison, Wisconsin. So they asked me to go up there and be the uh, eight-state Midwest biologist. So I did that. I was up there and the biologist for eight Midwest states and was there for nine years. So it was almost like going home, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. It wasn't unfamiliar territory with me, but um, one of the big deals at that time with the Farm Bill was the Wetland Reserve Program. And um, the the Wetland Reserve Program in the Midwest was, was a huge program, especially in Iowa and the Dakotas and Minnesota. So we spent a lot of time standing that program up. And, you know, doing what's right for waterfowl and ducks and, and all that kind of stuff. Then they um, decided they wanted me to go into the senior executive program for USDA. And uh, to make a long story short, I ended up in Washington, D.C. Um, and spent uh, the last nine to ten years of my career in Washington, D.C. And you retired. You were ready to hang it up and uh, grab a fly rod for the rest of your day. What was that, 2011? Yeah, no, I think it was more maybe 2010, 2011, right in there. Um, I was eligible to retire, and we wanted to move back to Kentucky. The kids were here. Um, I felt like there was other areas of the conservation world that I might be able to impact or work in. So you kind of have to leave one <laughs> yeah. to go to the other. And I wasn't sure what that was going to be, 
but I knew it would be in Kentucky. You mentioned the Farm Bill. Just I've done a program on the Farm Bill here on this program, and it's amazing the impact that piece of legislation has had on wildlife conservation in this state, well, nationwide, yeah. low these many years, mm -hmm. 50, 60, whatever years it has been. I was, I was very involved in the 2008 Farm Bill um, when that passed and spent quite a bit of time working with both the U.S. House and the U.S. Senate Ag Committees as we pulled together the conservation title and, and rewrote some things in there. From a program standpoint, when I was with NRCS in Washington, one of their senior officials there, I had what people commonly referred to as the Environmental Quality Incentive Program, the acronym is EQIP, the Wildlife Habitat Incentive Program, uh, which is WIP. I had several of the wetland easement programs there at various times, and I also had our emergency program. But if you take the Wildlife Habitat Incentive Program, for instance, at that time it had about a $50 million budget nationwide, just that one program. Um, all of the programs I had combined were over a $1 billion a year in budget. So our, our whole department-wide budget here is around $52, $53 million. So I had one program that was wildlife-oriented right. that had $50 million, let alone EQIP, which was close to a $1 billion on its own. I'm wondering if, based on numbers alone, you're saying $50 million and a $1 billion, does that make the Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife job that much easier, or is it just another set of challenges? You can't really gauge the complexity of work by the, the dollar value of what you're managing. With the department here, um, we have such a broad based broad base of constituency. You know, uh, this morning I've already heard from squirrel hunters. By noon I may have heard from commercial fishermen in West Kentucky. I may have heard from houndsmen in East Kentucky. Um, I may have heard from, you know, some of our elk uh, guides in East Kentucky, you know, that deer season's on. We just had, a lot of people may not know this, so I may be telling them something that's new, but we had the largest kill of white-tailed deer during the month of September that we've ever had. So in a given day, I can hear from all those places, uh, let alone the operational complexities of the department. You know, we have the Salado Wildlife Center. We have the conservation camps. We have three fish hatcheries. We've got about 83 wildlife management areas. Um, so I can probably make you dizzy just talking about it. <laughs> As this hour wears on, I would like to talk specifically about program by program, you know, fishing, elk, fins, lakes. But you brought up an interesting point that you have a lot of constituency. and You'll take calls from a variety of people. By and large, that's going to be people who hunt or fish, or boat. However, Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife is charged with everything natural, all wildlife that is native to the state, and protecting those habitats. What is your department's mission toward the passive user, the hikers, the canoeists, bird watching, backyard wildlife? Yeah, and we're, we're involved in a lot of those things as well. Um, you know, we've got a state-of-the-art muscle facility we're involved there in propagating mussels for reintroduction to streams. And we actually do a lot of contract work for other states because they don't have the type of facility we have. We're involved in coordination amongst several of the southern states in migratory bird habitat. When you have 83 wildlife management areas, mm -hmm. there's a whole host of other wildlife species and people that are interested in them that benefit from that. Um, and same way with our aquatics. You know, when we're working with our fishing program, uh, we can have a, a tremendous impact on, on mussel and mussel propagation, you know, other endangered and threatened species. And, and like it or not, we have to work with those things because there's certain regulations that impact some of the types of things that people can do out there because there are threatened and endangered species. So, so if we're on the front end of that, we can help mitigate some of that impact either to farmers or it could be surface mining companies or, or others, and, and make them more partners than adversaries in the process. One thing that anyone would have to respect about you or anyone in your position, Commissioner Johnson, is the fact that you have so many bosses. I tried to list them. I actually did. I have them on a list. You answer not only to 
the Fish and Wildlife Commission. You have every hunter, fisher, and boater in the state as your boss. You have the governor of Kentucky as your boss. You have the cabinet secretary. And you also have a little group of folks called the state legislature. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of people to answer to. How do you balance that? Well, and Charlie, you're only hitting the tip of the iceberg. (laughs) Um, I mean, we've got other groups like uh, the League of Kentucky Sportsmen sure. that, are, that are very, very active, um, the Kentucky Houndsmen Association. And, and we could just name off groups after groups after groups. And, um, you know, they all feel really, really passionate. Everybody you read off there, from from the governor and the first lady, they're all passionate about Kentucky fish and wildlife one you have to start out by being a really really good listener what's amazing is there's a lot of common threads amongst all those groups and and those are the kinds of things you can focus on and then have an impact on on a lot of the broad interests that are that are brought to the table treat them all with respect and appreciate the passion they have stay focused on those things you know it it all comes together and and um The key is to make them partners and stakeholders and and bring them along with you. Common ground. It's a great place to start. You're being introduced to Greg Johnson, the new head of the Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife. He says success in your outdoor pursuits is the same for success at the Department of Fish and Wildlife. It's as simple as one, two, three. We'll find out just what those steps are. I'm Charlie Baglin, and this is Kentucky Afield Radio. Charlie Baglin back, and this or any other edition of Kentucky Field Radio you'd like to hear again or share the link with your friends, you can find us on our YouTube channel or on iTunes. Just search for Kentucky Field Radio. It's time now for our fishing report. Kentucky Field Radio, this is Charlie Baglin. What happens when you do things right? You'll hear what the commissioner of the Department of Fish and Wildlife has to say on that after the break. Deer in the headlights. Watch out, Mr. Deer. (laughs) Singing with your kids in the car is one way to keep deer hazard season in mind. And should a deer catch your headlights, flash those lights, sound your horn, break its concentration to scurry it along. There's one. And where there's one, there may be two or three more. Deer hazard season runs through November. So be wise behind the wheel while nature runs its course. A message from Fish and Wildlife and the Kentucky Office of Highway Safety. Boys were in trouble. About ten seconds later, he said boys were going down. A true story. And it sunk right out from under us. Twenty degrees. Within seconds, one boating trip went straight down. The water was bone chilling. Once you hit that water, it's so cold you can't move. The human body wasn't designed for this. It took my breath away as soon as I hit it. And my hands were so cold in a matter of seconds that I couldn't pop the clip on my waders to get them off. Conditions were so bad it's amazing that anybody survived. Perfect for duck hunting, but not for a swim in the middle of a river. Going overboard is never the thought. You have to think ahead. Fun can turn frantic in seconds. There's no time to react when your world just sinks out from under you. Three hunters, two survivors, one reason. Your life jacket's got your back. Make sure your first mate isn't your last. I really don't think that I could have made it without a life jacket. Your Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife reminds you, your life jacket's got your back. And the backing of sportsmen on winter water everywhere. You are listening to Kentucky Field Radio. My name is Charlie Baglin, and we are into our second half hour with a special guest on this week's show. He is Greg Johnson. This gentleman took over the reins as commissioner for the Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife in May 2014, and he has been going nonstop ever since. And like any operation, you proceed with a few goals in mind. This is something uh, Mr. Johnson calls pillars, and number one is... The Department of Fish and Wildlife is sportsman-centric. That's right. Sportsman-centric is one that, that I try to get our department to stay focused on. So, in other words, people that hunt, people that fish, they buy licenses, they buy tags, they buy permits. Uh, they account for around half of our total budget, which is around 25 to $26 million. Plus, 
it's that money that we're able to leverage our federal matching dollars against. So the higher that figure is, then the more federal matching dollars that we're eligible for. And then, then, then the result is, uh, from that, you know, we've got probably the number one white-tailed deer herd in the nation, mm-hmm. uh, according to Field and Stream and, and Outdoor Life. We have the number one elk program east of the Mississippi River. Um, we just got recognized about our quail program, and, and we're really trying really, really hard on, on our small game programs. Um, we stock about 6 million fish a year. Um, we have our Fin Lake program, fishing in neighborhoods. It's more urban-centered. So that's the result of the investment that our shareholders, our people that hunt and fish, I kind of consider them shareholders, have made in the department. And then we, in turn, turn around and, and try to run a, a very good program that's sustainable for future generations. Now, the second pillar, then, is putting a priority on properly managing the resource. A good indicator of that, again, is what I talked about earlier, um, you know, some of the, the wildlife and fisheries populations we have across the state. And then pillar number three? That is uh, memorable experiences. I don't know about anybody else, but if I'm at deer camp or if I'm at fishing camp, if I'm around friends, uh, neighbors, um, if I'm around my children, and we're talking about hunting and fishing, it's not always about how many fish you caught or how big the deer was. It was the whole experience, and and that's what you talk about. If us as a department are doing one and two correctly, then people are going to have very memorable experience when they hunt and fish or if they're enjoying the outdoors by canoeing or boating, if they're viewing migratory songbirds. Some of our wildlife areas, we, we do allow horseback riding, so they might be enjoying that activity. They might be field trialing beagle hounds at one of the wildlife management areas. If we're doing things right, that's going to be a positive experience. And and there's memories there that people then share with their nieces, nephews, children, grandchildren. They, in turn, then want to pass this fish and wildlife and outdoor legacy on to future generations to enjoy. So then they become part of the whole effort. You have a number of programs that people will relate to. The fellow that comes to the classroom and teaches conservation, they see the fisheries biologist, they see the conservation officer. So let's talk about some of those individual programs. Uh, Number one, I trust, would be deer season. Boone and Crockett love this state. Field and Stream, as you mentioned, love this state. It's a credit to the past leadership of different commission members that we've had sit on our commission, different commissioners that we've had over the decades in in building that program. You know, if you go back to about, I think, 1977, maybe, somewhere in there, our deer population might have been around 30 or 40,000 deer across the state. Now, for those that are unfortunate and experience some deer depredation on their crops, that might have been a pretty good number. (laughs) And I'm just kind of tongue-in-cheek there, but we've increased that herd probably close to a million. Uh, But it's not just the number, it's the quality of the herd. And, again, that goes to to our biologists and, and others that have worked with our biologists, you know, in a, in a partnership mode to not just have a deer herd but a quality deer herd. But I do see where sometimes our deer herd gets sizable enough where farmers experience some crop depredation. And, and we recognize that. And like I was explaining earlier, we've, we've been working with the Farm Bureau, Hunters for Hungry, and, and other groups to try to address those kinds of situations. Also in the deer family, elk. Kentucky has what is billed as the largest elk herd in the east. That's something to be proud of. This started in 1997. That's an established herd. Mm-hmm. And has management changed, or do you anticipate it changing uh, from a program we're starting up to a program now that we have to manage forever. It really doesn't matter where you go with wildlife or fisheries. It's always changing. Uh, That's the only constant thing is change. So, again, the elk herd and the success with the elk herd, again, is is a tribute to the folks that have come before me, past commissioners again and commission members and other partners and stakeholders 
uh, in and across Kentucky and East Kentucky and, and some of our senators and representatives up there, and, and the list goes on. But I would view the elk program as, you know, we kind of had a startup company, so to speak. And the way you manage a startup company is, is different once you get that company established and it's moving. And, and, and so now with the elk herd, it's not a startup effort anymore. Now we have to figure out how we not only sustain the herd, but it's also habitat management. You know, there's a whole host of factors that go around that. So it's going to take a different type of strategy now to maintain that herd from a quality standpoint and also make sure they have the kind of habitat there in eastern Kentucky that they prefer. About two months ago, we held an elk summit at uh, Buckhorn Lake State Park and brought in a lot of partners and stakeholders. And we talked about exactly that, is is where do we go with our elk herd between now and the year 2030? And um, and that's what we'll call it when we get our plan together. It'll be elk 2030. And it'll guide us going forward then on how we want to manage that elk herd going forward. Could that mean more liberal harvest? If the elk continue to increase in numbers, it could. Right now, we're issuing about 1,000 tags a year on an estimated herd size of about 10,000 elk. So that's about 10% of the population. We also are involved in uh, what I call paying forward. So in other words, other states helped yeah. us get those elk and helped us get established in the elk program. We, in turn, are also helping some other states do that. So our commission has set a number of about 50 elk per year when we do some trades with other states. We don't trade elk every year, but in the years that we do, we never take more than 50, and the bulk of those are going to be cows when we do, when we do collect them. One of the things that we're looking at right now, and people will begin to hear more about it, is, um, you know, folks want us to try to be more aggressive with a, a grouse program here in the state. People my age are used to uh, uh, being able to hunt grouse and being very successful at it. And it's kind of tough now across Kentucky to do that. And Kentucky's not the only state. Um, just about any state in the south or southeast are having the similar challenges that we have uh, with grouse. We've been working with Wisconsin. Uh, we feel like uh, they can take some of our elk. They have a herd in northern Wisconsin, uh, quite frankly, the area I used to be a fishing guide in. They've had a herd up there a long time. So we've talked to them about maybe getting some grouse from them. You know, it sounds simple, but it's not. Uh, grouse, while you can trap them, they don't transport and relocate very well. They quit eating. They lose body weight. So there's a lot of research being done to figure out how to do that better. So in addition to some grouse that we'll get, and we'll study a small group of them, we'll put some transmitters in them, make sure we know how well they're doing in Kentucky. But before we even do that, we'll do a lot of habitat improvement for grouse that not only our local birds can respond to, but then uh, when we start bringing these grouse in from Wisconsin, and if, if they survive like we hope they will, you know, they'll have a good home to, to establish in. There's nothing quite like the sound of hearing a grouse drumming. Yeah. In those yeah. eastern Kentucky hills. Yeah. So, you know, we hope, we're hoping that will be successful. And if it is, um, I think it'll be a, a monumental move forward for Kentucky in, in the grouse program. We don't have a whole lot of time to talk about all the programs that the Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife administers, but maybe just a few of the highlights. How's fishing here? Today's challenges are tomorrow's opportunities. So the Fishing and Neighborhood Program has been a tremendous success. That's where we have small lakes and ponds in more urban settings. Uh, county and city government cooperate with us. But it, it provides an opportunity for people in an urban environment that maybe don't have a boat, uh, don't know how to get on a big lake and find fish and be successful but maybe they still want to fish, so they buy a license, they go to one of these small lakes, we stock them with trout and catfish, and they have some success, and they have a good time. And county governments have been very successful in building whole little uh, outdoor communities around these lakes. Um, for instance, the one at Whitehall in, in Madison County, you know, they put in blacktop walking trails, they have a big bike path, they have a playground, 
They have bathroom facilities. They have a pavilion. And if you go down there and fish uh, for trout or catfish out of that fin lake, uh, probably for every person actually fishing, there'll be five more engaging in another activity yeah. around the lake. So it just becomes a hub of outdoor activity. So we're real excited about that program. The challenge we have is our hatcheries are at capacity as far as production. So even if we wanted to expand the fin lake program, we really don't have the capacity of hatcheries to produce the fish to go into those lakes. So that's that's one thing we have to look at is uh, we have a successful program. You know, how can we move forward with it? Getting to know your commissioner of the Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife, he is Greg Johnson. A chat on some of the more popular programs. Will a fishing license and hunting license continue to pay the bills for conservation? We are back with our final few with the commissioner. Stay with us. I'm Charlie Beglin. This is Kentucky Field Radio. This is Kentucky Field Radio. My name is Charlie Baglin, and we are back with our final few with Greg Johnson, newly appointed commissioner with the Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife Resources. Before we went to break, Commissioner, we began a discussion on some of the favorite subjects of the department, deer and elk fishing and access to do these things, and making the experience a good one, one you'd want to repeat again and again. Now, not everything in the outdoors is always sunny and bright. There are diseases in wildlife and wild plants that make their way across your desk. One biggie, though, directly affecting your department and your division of fisheries is the Asian carp. Really, you're talking about two carp. Their uh, common names are big head carp and the other one's a silver carp. And, of course, people are probably familiar with the German carp that we've had in our waters for a long, long time. But these two carp are a lot different. They're very prolific. They reproduce. They produce a lot of young. And the other downside to them is they're at the lower end of the the feeding scale. So they they feed on a lot of the plankton and microorganisms in the water, which, you know, if you take that base away from that whole ecosystem, then that affects uh, forage fish, that bass and catfish and other fish feed on so it upsets the whole ecosystem uh, but we've been very aggressive with uh, marketing uh, industry on setting up uh, operations in west kentucky that they'll take those carp and then uh, they might use them in in uh, pet food uh, operations um, some of them are going over to asia where they actually eat them so we've been aggressive uh, trying to help industries locate in West Kentucky where our commercial fishermen then, uh, you know, we can provide jobs for commercial fishermen and the industries also provide jobs and really go after these fish. Uh, the other thing we've done is we've got a lot of research projects going on so we can find out how these carp are vulnerable so we know where to go after them when they're very vulnerable and really get as many of them as we can. Um, and then there's been a sport fishery kind of pop up around them. There's a lot of people who really like to bow fish for them, and they get some really big carp. I mean, you're talking 40, 50 pounders, and, and they're making the front page of some of our sports magazines. The kids of today are Kentucky's future, and your Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife has had a program that I don't think many other agencies like yours around the nation have. That's the conservation education program what's your opinion of that program and where do you see it going forward there are other states that have that kind of program but they don't do it quite the way we do it you know we have three conservation camps camp curry in west kentucky camp wallace in southern kentucky down in wayne county and camp webb um, up around grayson we put about five thousand kids a year through those camps, and they've been at it for decades. Uh, we have folks in their 40s and 50s that are alumni to those camps that went through them when they were children. So we think we've touched around 200 to 300,000 people over the years that have gone through those conservation camps. Uh, we also have um, uh, outdoor education in classrooms. You know, we have people that actually go into classrooms and work with the schools on that stuff. And then we have other clinics all across the state that touches our youth on on hunting and fishing. So we have an aggressive program. These kids are our future leaders. If we've touched their life, 
through those conservation camps, then hopefully going forward they're going to be a proponent for outdoor activities and hunting and fishing when they become leaders in their community or potential leaders in the state. There are two more topics I want to ask you about, and one is the future of fish and wildlife departments across America. Hunting and fishing isn't quite the draw that it was, let's say, when you and I were children. It's those license dollars, it's those people that help pay for conservation across the state. What do you see down the road? Do you think this will come in your tenure, that you will have to uh, sit down and say, hmm, well, what do we do about this? Other funding sources beyond just trying to increase the number of license buyers. Well, no, I think the think the model we have in Kentucky is working and, and will still work for, for quite a few years out. Other states like Missouri, you were talking about Missouri, they have a one six of one percent sales tax that helps fund their conservation programs. There's other states that that do rely on uh, appropriated dollars uh, through their general assembly and executive branch of those states. Kentucky's model is based more on hunting and fishing license sales. Well, the last time I looked, there there was a Cabela's in Louisville. <laughs> uh, there's a Gander Mountain in Bowling Green. Uh, Cabela's put another small store in Bowling Green. There's a Sportsman's Warehouse in Lexington. Um, they're in business because they can make money. Those, those, the market is there. Those businesses, the market is obviously there, and it's an expanded market. You know, it's it's archery in the schools. So now they're selling archery equipment not just for hunting but but for use in the schools, fishing, boating, hunting, bow fishing for fish. Just the list goes on. And of course, those excise taxes are collected, and then then that's the base of dollars that goes towards that federal match. So I really see, at least in Kentucky, this continued passion for outdoor activities. What's on your mind personally about the new position with the department? I'll probably go back to something I said earlier. Um, what I've really been impressed with as commissioner is just the passion that uh, people across Kentucky bring to the outdoor world. And um, the broad constituents we have, but they're all so, so passionate. And I really do appreciate that. And um, and then on the flip side, it translates into our department and our employees. And you see that same that same passion. You know, how could any commissioner not get a whole influx of energy every day you come to work when you get to work in that kind of an environment? Again, sir, it has been a pleasure, and I feel like I have a state full of hunters, anglers, boaters, and practically anybody who loves the outdoors and nature. When I say welcome to the position, and we feel like we have a partner in the great outdoors in you, in that front office. Well, thank you very much, and I appreciate being on the show. And I think you know this, but I'm, I'm very accessible to our sportsmen across the state. So feel free to email me or call me anytime you want to, and we'll talk about what's on your mind. You can find out more online about the Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife Resources, its commissioner and staff, fw.ky.gov. We are out of time. This is Charlie Baglin inviting you to join us in a week, and we will go inside outdoors again right here on Kentucky Field Radio. Thank you.